Well, hi friends. You've joined a talk named How to Stand on the Shoulders of Giants, our journey of open sourcing, open service mesh, reading code, writing code, and asking the world for help. My name is Delian Raichev. I'm a principal software engineer with Microsoft Azure, and I spent the last year working on open service mesh with an incredible team of engineers. Now, in this talk, we're going to talk about what a service mesh is in general. We're going to dig into the details of what service mesh interface is, and then we're going to talk about what exactly open service mesh is. I'll show you a demo of open service mesh. We're going to take a look at the code, and then we'll look into the lessons that we learned in the process of open sourcing open service mesh. Now, let's step back and talk about what is a service mesh in general. And for that, I would like to illustrate the features or the value that service mesh can add to your business by first pretending that we're a CTO of an online bookstore. As a CTO of an online bookstore, we have quite a few engineering teams. They're working on very many microservices that we already have running in our Kubernetes infrastructure. But for the next quarter, uh, as a CTO, we have the three tasks of first improving security, building observability for our microservices, and then figuring out how to dynamically manage traffic. Now, improving security, we want to do by being able to apply fine-grained authorization and um, encryption. We want to implement mutual TLS between all the microservices because we're running in a zero trust environment. Second, we need observability. We want to be able to collect metrics, collect distributed traces, logs. We want to be able to audit our system. And most importantly, we want to be able to understand the topology of our microservices in order to unravel the complexity and make improvements. And finally, we want to implement dynamic traffic management. Uh, we want to implement service failover, path-based routing, traffic splitting and shifting, and various deployment strategies like Canary deploys, for instance, because we want to deploy new versions of our software with zero downtime. Well, how can we achieve that? I think in a classic scenario, we could just go to the software engineering teams and ask them to just start working on that. Improve security by implementing MTLS in every single endpoint of all of your microservices. Please implement observability by instrumenting logging, metrics, traces, send them to a service. And then we can manage traffic uh, by implementing client-side retry logic, circuit breaking. But that's a lot of work to ask from engineering teams that are already busy implementing bookstore-specific business logic. Now, they could leverage libraries that exist to implement most of those features. A few of them come to mind. We can use Twitter's Finagle or Netflix Hystrix or Google Stubby. But those tend to be language-specific. And um, oftentimes, we also need to understand how those libraries work and it's not uh, necessarily a uh, easy or quick effort. So we don't necessarily want every engineer to become a security and encryption or MTLS expert. We definitely don't want to re-implement, retry, circuit breaking, or really any other feature in every product and every language. We know this is going to lead to varying degrees of quality of the implementations. And we definitely don't want to have uh, various configurations depending on the team. And we don't want to uh, have each team be responsible to manage their own certificate uh, rotation or certificate distribution. That's going to end up in very many different techniques and inconsistency and insecurity because of that. What we want instead is engineers to focus on the core features of the product, which is a bookstore. And we also want to have a homogenous security, observability, traffic management for every product and any language that we're using in our company. And finally, we want to have a system that can centrally manage all configurations. So configuration can be reviewed, audited, etc. How do we achieve that? Well, I believe that all those features can be given to us by a service mesh. The service mesh can be that infrastructure that will give us all those features without having to ask all the engineers to commit extra time to build those features out. Let's talk about a service mesh. Let's define it. I'm going to use a few references here. Um, I love Lee Calcout's book on Istio, Up and Running, 
William Morgan from Buoyant wrote an excellent article on what a service mesh is and why you need one. And of course, Red Hat's blog on what a service mesh is excellent. So to summarize those, a service mesh is an L4 or L7 communications infrastructure for microservices as well as monoliths. Now, a service mesh, like we talked, and this is what we want, is going to shift the responsibility for much of the reliability, visibility, and security out of the application code and into the networking infrastructure. And this is what we want. We don't want to write all those features in the app code. We want to shift it into the networking infrastructure, which then means that the service mesh will decouple and centralize the functional responsibilities of instrumenting and operating services out of the developers and into some sort of operators. So we can free up the developers to focus on the features and an operator can then take care of those extra features. So to summarize and to formalize, Service Mesh is the observable, debuggable, reliable, and secure data plane for any programming language or framework. How does that sound? Okay, so if you wanted to cook a Service Mesh, what would those ingredients be? How do you actually make it? Well, first of all, uh, you need a data plane. Uh, for data plane, we're going to be using some sort of a reverse proxy, and there's quite a few of those, and they're all excellent. For instance, Envoy, Linkerd, Nginx, or HAProxy come to mind. We're going to need a control plane for the proxy, and we need some sort of an API to be able to instrument and um, declare the topology of the service mesh. We could use CRDs, JSON, or SMI spec for that. And so the recipe, we're going to use those ingredients. Well, we're going to add the data plane component, each proxy. Uh, we're going to add it to each one of our payloads or binaries that are running on our Kubernetes cluster. So each pod on our Kubernetes cluster that needs network access will get a sidecar with um, a proxy for OSM that's Envoy. We're going to connect those proxies to a control plane, which is uh, going to tell the proxies exactly what to do by configuring them. And finally, we're going to apply various policies via this API, this Service Mesh API. So now I'm going to delve into this API. I'm going to talk about Service Mesh interface specifically. So what is SMI? SMI was something that Microsoft announced in May 2019. And um, it is a specification for service meshes that run on Kubernetes. This is a common standard that can be implemented by a variety of providers. Now, what are those standards? Well, so we have three pillars. The first one is traffic policy. Second one is traffic telemetry. And finally, traffic management. When we say a variety of providers, what do we mean? Well, that means that you can actually define those routing, telemetry, and traffic policies in an abstract way using Service Mesh Interface and then apply it to different vendors. So you use the same declaration for your Service Mesh features regardless of what the Service Mesh vendor is. You can use Istio, you can use Console or Linkerd, and the, the SMI policies will remain the same. Allows you to um, declare service mesh features in a vendor neutral way. And so open service mesh is one of those service meshes that supports a service mesh interface. In fact, open service mesh uh, implements service mesh interface natively. It is not uh, the canonical or the reference implementation of service mesh interface. It is just one of the implementations and um, Open Service Mesh was uh, open sourced or announced in August of 2020, and it became a CNCF sandbox project in September of this year. We welcome you to come and check out our GitHub repository at github.com slash open service mesh slash OSM. Now, let's take a look at OSM now. So Open Service Mesh is a lightweight and extensible cloud native service mesh. There are four principles that we embrace from the get go that have been guiding us throughout the last year of developing Open Service Mesh. First of all, we want to build a service mesh in a repository, which is very simple and easy to understand and contribute to. This is focusing on folks that arrive at the GitHub repository. We want them to have really easy time onboarding and kind of learning from the source code. Second, we want to make Open Service Mesh to be effortless to install, maintain, and operate. The focus here obviously being the operators of the Service Mesh. And when trouble arises, how do we make the troubleshooting process painless? 
This is um, our aspirational goal to build tools that make it very easy to identify and fix issues within the service mesh, which tends to be very complex. And finally, of course, we want to keep it really easy to configure by leveraging service mesh interface. So what are the features that we have in open service mesh? Well, as of version 0 0.5, which uh, points to the fact that it's not production ready just yet, you can apply policies which will govern the TCP and HTTP traffic access between the various microservices in your Kubernetes cluster. You can encrypt the traffic. In fact, um, open service mesh supports uh, MTLS um, out of the box and um, only encrypted traffic will be flowing once uh, MTLS is installed and we're leveraging short-lived certificates with a self-signed CA. Uh, open service mesh will um, start collecting traces and metrics as soon as it's installed uh, to give you the observability that you need or we need as a CTO. And finally, uh, with open service mesh, uh, we can implement traffic split and traffic shifting. And we're going to show you this in the demo shortly where we're going to split traffic between two different versions of Bookstore. All right, let's take a look under the hood. So here's a Kubernetes cluster and we have already installed OSM. On the right side, we see the OSM controller pod and there are five top level modules inside the controller pod. On the left side, we see SMI spec being applied to the Kubernetes cluster. And in the gray box, we have a Kubernetes service account, a, a Kubernetes pod, and three containers in it. Now, let's take a look at the SMI spec. So the SMI spec is being applied to the Kubernetes cluster using the kubectl command. SMI spec is in the form of some sort of YAML, and it defines policies uh, which explicitly allow various services to talk to each other. SMI is constructed in such a way where uh, microservices that are explicitly allowed to talk to each other will be permitted. If they're not, um, if policy does not exist, then they're not permitted to talk to each other. Now, the SMI spec will be uh, consumed by the OSM controller, which has informers, and this is represented by the orange mesh specification box, which is observing the SMI spec events. Uh, and next, uh, we are going to take a look at the yellow box, which is the webhook and injector. The point of that box is to uh, essentially intercept all the pod creation events flowing through the Kubernetes cluster and augment each one of the Kubernetes pods that belongs to a namespace, which is in the service mesh. Once a Kubernetes creation pod uh, event is intercepted, uh, we are going to augment that pod spec with two new containers. So the app container is the original container that's in the pod. We're going to add two new ones. The first one is the init container, which is ephemeral. That init container will uh, instantiate uh, or essentially apply a few IP table rules, which will then route all the traffic flowing in and out of the app container through the Envoy proxy. The Envoy proxy is the second container. It's not ephemeral, it's gonna stay there forever. Uh, the Envoy proxy is a sidecar, which is actually what adds all the features that we as the CTO of the bookstore want from the service mesh. The Envoy proxy will augment the app container and it will add all the retry logic. It will add the MTLS encryption, etc. Now, the webhook plus injector module in the OSM controller pod will create the Envoy sidecar with a particular bootstrap config from the get-go. And that bootstrap config will contain two things. The first one is the FQDN of the OSM controller pod. And the second one will be a um, MTLS certificate, which is very specific to the Envoy proxy. The FQDN is pointing to the proxy control plane. And once the Envoy establishes an MTLS gRPC connection to the proxy control plane, it will present its unique certificate. And then the OSM controller pod will know exactly which Envoy that is, which pod it's coming from, and which app container this Envoy is fronting. That will allow the OSM controller pod to send the exact configuration or the unique configuration needed by that Envoy proxy. Now, speaking of configuration for the Envoy proxy, let's take a look at the uh, endpoint providers box, which is the blue box on your screen on the right side. The endpoint providers 
will observe the Kubernetes cluster and it will provide us with a list of IP addresses and port numbers for peer envoys that are fronting other um, app containers so that our envoy here will know exactly what other IP addresses and port numbers to route traffic to. In the middle we have a certificate manager and this is kind of an abstraction around either HashiCorp Vault or Cert Manager IO or our own internal Cert Manager or Cert Issuer which is based on Golang's Crypto X509 libraries. And uh, finally OSM will also install Prometheus and Grafana to allow you to visualize various metrics in the cluster and um, also it will program Envoy to send traces to a Jaeger instance should you choose to do that. Let's take a look at a summary of the five components inside the OSM controller pod. We talked about the proxy control plane, which is where all the envoys connect to. We talked about the certificate manager, which is an abstraction over either HashiCorp Vault, Cert Manager IO, or an internal Cert issuer. And then we talked about the endpoint providers, which gives you a list of IP addresses and port numbers. And finally, the mesh specification, which is the SMI policies. We have the mesh catalog which will combine the outputs of all those uh, facilities and it will use the proxy control plane to send configuration to the various proxies. And so if we were to look back at the recipe of cooking an, a service mesh, what would the particular recipe be for open service mesh? Where the data plane for open service mesh is Envoy proxy, the control plane is Lyft's Go control plane which implements XDS. And of course, we're using the SMI SDK. The API that we uh, use, of course, is Service Mesh Interface, which Open Service Mesh implements that natively. All right, now let's take a look at the demonstration of Open Service Mesh. First, let me tell you about the various components in my demonstration here. In the middle, we have a bookstore. This is one microservice which essentially is a server which you can buy books from using just HTTP GET. The top left of our screen we have a book buyer. This is an infinite loop of a service which will be HTTP GET in books from the bookstore. And in the top right we have a book warehouse. So when the bookstore runs out of books it will be HTTP GET uh, getting books from the book warehouse. And we're going to be surprised to find out on the bottom left corner there's a book thief. That service is also in an infinite loop uh, performing HTTP GET uh, on the bookstore and also buying books. What we want to do, first of all, is we want to apply a policy that blocks the book thief from purchasing books from the bookstore. And second, we're going to want to deploy a new version of bookstore. We want to deploy bookstore uh, v2 without um, experiencing any downtime, without the book buyer noticing. And let's take a look at how we can do that. All right, and now let's take a look at a demo of uh, Open Service Mesh. So first, I'm going to explain uh, what we are seeing on the screen here. Uh, first of all, on the right side, you will see that uh, I have my terminal window, and uh, it's uh, essentially issuing the kubectl get pods command um, in an infinite loop. Uh, we have the various namespaces, book buyer, bookstore, book thief, book warehouse. Those are all the actors in my service mesh. Uh, and uh, you will also uh, see that um, we have in the column ready the uh, number of containers of each pod. They all have uh, only one container because none of those have really been uh, joined to the service mesh, which I've already installed. So I do have OSM controller running and um, it's ready to go, but like I said, none of those namespaces have been joined to the service mesh uh, just yet. All right, um, yeah, and so uh, we're going to issue various commands in my other terminal on the bottom window. Uh, that's where we're going to be editing the various YAML files, uh, SMI spec. Uh, we're going to execute uh, shell commands. Uh, I do have port forwarding running, which is uh, going to uh, allow us to uh, see all the various windows on the left side. Uh, so on the left side we have uh, port forwarding, like I said, from the book buyer pod, the book thief, and the bookstore. Um, the, the book thief is uh, much like the book buyer also um, obtaining books from the bookstore in an infinite loop. 
here's bookstore v1 uh, and bookstore v2 uh, and like I said uh, we're going to be uh, watching the uh, counts of books increase and um, over time uh, we're going to um, make sure that uh, book thief eventually stops uh, purchasing books all right so first I'm going to show you using a uh, pickup uh, file that um, the bookstore uh, commands or bookstore HTTP get calls are not encrypted so I want to show you by using TCP dump that the traffic uh, flying or flowing from a book buyer to a bookstore is not yet encrypted uh, because like I said we haven't uh, joined those namespaces to the service mesh so I'm going to capture a little bit of traffic I'm going to open it in Wireshark and uh, browse through the traffic uh, here to uh, show you here's one of the get requests so as you can see uh, we have uh, the get uh, request from uh, book buyer to bookstore and uh, the traffic is not encrypted now uh, I would like to encrypt the traffic that's the first thing that we want to do uh, we want to make sure that uh, you know, since we're running in a zero trust networking uh, environment uh, we want to encrypt all that traffic uh, so for that purpose uh, we're going to join the uh, namespaces into the service mesh here's the script that I've prepared we're going to use OSM namespace add CLI command we're going to issue that command for all of the uh, namespaces that we have uh, it's also important to mention that um, we're going to apply this config map to open service mesh which is going to switch OSM controller into permissive traffic policy mode uh, that means that we're not going to be uh, mutating any of the traffic patterns we'll simply observe we're not going to be um, blocking traffic uh, with SMI policies that will come later uh, and now one thing that I need to tell you about is the rolling restart script uh, because uh, we have a few existing uh, pods already running we're gonna have to issue cube cuddle rollout restart for all the deployments which will uh, restart the existing pods those existing pods will be terminated new pods will be created and um, they're, they're, those new pods are going to be augmented with um, an envoy site proxy let me run the script quickly and uh, let's uh, take a look at uh, what happens to the uh, pods as we're uh, restarting those uh, deployments you'll see that uh, pods with one container are being terminated and uh, instead we're creating uh, new pods with uh, two containers two containers because we have not only the original uh, binary the original payload but we also now have the envoy sidecar which uh, is uh, where all the new features are going to be coming from I do need to now restart my port forwarding scripts to uh, port forward to the newly created pods and now we should see again uh, the counts of uh, books purchased or books stolen uh, start to increase uh, starts from zero because those are brand new pods like we said already all right so here it is now we have all those pods joined to the service mesh and uh, that's proven by the fact that we have two uh, pods two uh, containers in there now I want to show you that the traffic is encrypted I'm going to uh, go ahead and uh, do another packet capture uh, just a little bit of traffic uh, I'm going to open that traffic uh, which I'm going to gather with TCP dump obviously uh, I'm going to open that uh, PCAP file in Wireshark and we're going to again try to find those HTTP GET requests but of course because now those pods are part of the service mesh part of OSM and uh, we have enabled MTLS already uh, we're gonna have a real hard time uh, finding those HTTP get requests because everything is encrypted so we can see the source and destination from book buyer to bookstore v1 uh, but uh, like I said it's not gonna be possible to view the payload here's uh, here are the packets all we can see is the fact that they have been encrypted with uh, uh, TLS v 1.2 and we can no longer see the body of the request I'm going to switch gears now and uh, show you what we have uh, done with uh, Jaeger uh, so we um, are collecting uh, traces 
and uh, you can see that um, Jaeger here is visualizing the topology of our service mesh. Uh, I have zoomed in so it's uh, visible on the screen and we have uh, book buyer and book thief uh, both uh, fetching books from bookstore v1 and bookstore v1 is replenishing books from uh, book warehouse. Uh, this uh, comes in with uh, open uh, service mesh pre-installed and so now we're gonna pretend that we're surprised that we're seeing book thief we're not happy with the fact that book thief is also purchasing books uh, from bookstore v1 and uh, the next uh, goal of our exercise is going to be to uh, block that particular traffic uh, going from book thief to bookstore v1 all right so we um, discovered that there's this bad actor called book thief and it's already stolen 111 books and uh, we want to prevent it from continuing to do that. We want to stop it from buying books from V1 and V2. And so for that purpose, we're going to apply um, a bunch of SMI policies. I'm going to run the script, which is going to apply the policies. And we're, go we're going to um, kind of instantly see that Book Thief's uh, number of books stolen will um, freeze at a given number. And uh, I'm going to walk you through now what I just did. Uh, let's take a look at uh, specifically the uh, deploy traffic target uh, policy. So like I said, uh, this is an SMI policy called uh, traffic target. And we're going to take a look at this uh, piece of YAML. And um, in particular, we're going to take a look at the um, source and destination. Source being book buyer or the service account of book buyer. Destination is bookstore, V1 specifically. And now uh, the reason um, we uh, are not no longer seeing uh, books stolen increase is because Book Thief is commented out in this policy. Essentially, Book Thief is um, not explicitly allowed, like Book Buyer, to communicate with Bookstore, which means it is blocked. And this is how uh, traffic target works. And there it is. Uh, book Thief is no longer able to steal books. And finally, I want to show you traffic split. Let's take a look at this policy. Here is deploy traffic split. So um, here's the YAML for the traffic split SMI policy. What you see is that uh, essentially traffic that is uh, going to the bookstore service will be split between bookstore V1, 100%, and bookstore V2 right now, 0% goes to that one. So uh, I'm going to tweak, tweak that. I'm going to change uh, traffic to 50-50 split between V1 and V2. I'm going to save this and uh, apply it. And so what you will uh, notice is that uh, traffic uh, flowing between book buyer and book thief will eventually start to uh, be split uh, equally between V1 and V2. And here is uh, Grafana to uh, help us uh, look at the various metrics that um, we can um, observe. Allow me to uh, tweak the UI here to start looking at metrics. Uh, and there we go. Already we're seeing that book buyer is uh, starting to purchase books from uh, bookstore V2 as well as V1. And if we refresh Grafana, we're starting to see success counts now for uh, traffic from book buyer to bookstore uh, V2 as well. And uh, if we decide that uh, Bookstore V2 is doing really well, everything's looking great, I'm going to change it to 100% of the traffic going to Bookstore V2. I'm going to deploy this. And uh, in a second, we're going to see that uh, books purchased from Bookstore V1 are going to freeze at uh, uh, 150 something. And all of the traffic is going to be flowing to Bookstore V2. We're already seeing the number of uh, success counts increase. All right, next I would like to very quickly show you how to get to the source code of Open Service Mesh and uh, read, write, contribute if you can. Uh, first of all, we're going to start with the Open Service Mesh design and all the interfaces that we've created to make this extensible. Uh, the design MD file contains all of the information you would need to get you started. Uh, you, I highly recommend you uh, go through that to understand how Open Service Mesh works and how Service Meshes in general uh, work. I think that you're going to find it uh, useful. Uh, second, 
you can actually take a look at uh, ADS stream DAGO. So this is the GERPC entry point for all envoys. This is how, uh, how all envoy proxies will uh, connect to the control plane and um, essentially uh, this is the, the go routine that would start when a new proxy connects to it. This is a good entry point to um, get you going to help you understand uh, what happens when an Envoy proxy connects, uh, how we issue all the um, discovery responses, how we uh, construct the proto buffers that configure the Envoys, and what that configuration is uh, based on. I highly advise you um, start with uh, the ADS stream that go file. Um, another uh, interesting uh, kind of piece of information uh, that it can get you going is uh, looking at the injector uh, or the patch that go file. Uh, this is essentially how the webhook in Open Service Mesh works. It will show you how we augment the pod spec uh, to add the bootstrap config. Uh, for the Envoy proxy, how to add the Envoy sidecar itself, uh, how we issue the uh, certificate uh, for the proxy, uh, how we create the init container, uh, etc. Uh, from this function, um, you can um, kind of start to uh, drill deeper into the um, Open Service Mesh repository. For instance, if you wanted to understand how the certificate management system works, you could look into the uh, issue certificate function. And um, finally, uh, you can uh, take a look at how XDS itself works by uh, looking at the ADS uh, server DAGO function. We've implemented um, essentially handlers for the endpoint discovery service, cluster discovery service, routes discovery, listener discovery, and secrets discovery. And those are kind of the um, five pillars of the configuration uh, for Envoy proxy. Um, you can uh, have those uh, links available through the slides. And now let's talk about the lessons learned in the process of open sourcing Open Service Mesh. Uh, I said a process because oftentimes we think of open sourcing a project as a binary event. Well, it's not a binary event. Um, even though you might think that um, all it takes is uh, just checking that box on GitHub saying, make the repo public, change the visibility. Um, in fact, uh, in actuality, open sourcing a project is a process and a project of in it itself. It's a marathon that takes a long time to run. Uh, and let me take you through the steps or the process of open sourcing a project. First of all, preparing to open source. Uh, start the preparation as early as possible. And first of all, think about the privacy of the contributors. Think about your own privacy. Uh, choose and set your commit email address carefully and decide whether to anonymize your email address will be available to the world after all. Um, and uh, as far as sensitivity and mindfulness, please do code, comment, and commit knowing that one day the entire world could be looking at this. So what that means is uh, while you're coding, committing, and commenting, writing comments, uh, think about are you leaking secrets? Um, anything that's sensitive to your organization internally or to you privately. Also, are you using language that may be perceived offensive to the uh, future community and contributors that you're building? Think about that um, external folks looking into what you're creating as well. And finally, transparency. Uh, from the early days, from the get-go, you should design, document, and make decisions with transparency in mind so that one day when a contributor arrives at your repo, they can uh, quickly answer the question of uh, why and how certain decision was made. So do document kind of how you're making decisions and put them in your public repository even before you go open source. And then when the time comes for you to flip the visibility bit and to open source your project, you need to kind of have answers for those two questions, why and when. First of all, know why you're doing it. For instance, we open sourced Open Service Mesh with three things in mind. First of all, we wanted to get advice and feedback from the other companies out there and the potential users of Open Service Mesh. Very important to us. Second of all, uh, we wanted to provide to the world one more implementation of Service Mesh. This is not the implementation, it's just one 
other implementation that we want to offer. And finally, we wanted to collaborate with the community in a vendor neutral space. Uh, second, of course, decide when it makes most sense for you um, to open source your project. And my advice for you is to open source as soon as possible, as soon as you can. That will allow you to get feedback, to iterate, uh, and don't wait for perfect code or perfect documentation. Uh, that's uh, hard to attain. Get that feedback as soon as possible. Uh, but don't open source sooner than before the guardrails are ready for your newcomers. What I mean by guardrail is do not open source before you have had a chance to build unit tests, to add static analysis to your CI, to write at least minimal documentation to help those early contributors on board, to help the early contributors feel safe and uh, feel validated when they're adding a feature, that feature is not going to break the system. I think that a few of those guardrails are necessary before you open source to um, create for a um, productive environment for your contributors. And then long term, um, after the project is uh, open source and it is public, uh, a few things happen and they're very interesting to me. First of all, the team dynamic will change. After all, open sourcing a project invites the whole world to join your team and communication will change. The communication channel change, uh, the, um, the time when people communicate changes and how they communicate change, of course. Uh, second, feature velocity uh, changes as well. Open sourcing um, and creating a new governance model uh, will require changes to how you actually publish designs, how you discuss those designs, how proposals are made, how you're approving PRs, and how you're triaging GitHub issues. Uh, reviews may slow down, but that will be much more fruitful because the community will be commenting and collaborating with you. Uh, and of course, the queue of GitHub issues and requests for features may grow, and um, that's uh, actually a feedback that um, I very much appreciate when uh, folks uh, come and tell us what they would like to see in Open Service Mesh or when they find bugs, it's a wonderful thing. And finally, um, if you see that extra feedback and those extra GitHub issues arriving, uh, you have to monitor uh, those and um, react to those. Also monitor all other channels, not just GitHub issues, but Slack, emails, all other channels that may exist. Uh, and like I said, feedback is a wonderful thing, but it comes at a cost. Uh, many new requests and triaging uh, will increase the attention demand on your team. And if the team is small, of course, that may take away from the core work. All right. And um, now something special, uh, parting thoughts. And uh, the topic of uh, this talk was uh, how to stand on the shoulders of giants. And uh, this actually points me to something that's uh, very dear to my heart, and that's uh, reading code reading code as in reading prose. Uh, and I think before we even start thinking about building something or before we open source the project that we've been working on, it would be a wonderful thing to go out there and research to see what prior art exists in the open source community. Uh, there are amazing search tools out there to find wonderful code. So I invite you to do that. Search for code similar to what you're building. Read that code to learn, to build, to be able to stand on the shoulders of giants who have come before you and have created something incredible. And then improve that code, use it, and attribute back, give attribution to the authors, uh, follow the rules and the licensing agreement, and of course contribute back, that's what open source is about. Uh, push back upstream your changes. And I want to point you to this uh, outstanding book that uh, Diomedes Spinelis wrote back in 2003. What a timeless piece. This is called uh, Code Reading, the Open Source Perspective. Uh, Diomedes Spinelis will, um, yeah, with this book, will teach you how to uh, read code, find code. Uh, and uh, this book has uh, been truly transformational for me. And finally, I want to encourage you to open source your projects so that uh, that code that you're going to open source so that you yourself can be someone else's giant so people can look at your code and learn from it. Thank you very much for attending the session. Please reach out. You can find me on Twitter. You can find me on LinkedIn. 
and please send me an email with any feedback you might have. Thank you so much.